Hello, good afternoon everyone. Welcome to the short webinar at Subanjaya Medical Center entitled today, uh, Lung Cancers in Never Smokers, a Hidden Disease. Uh, made, uh, I mean, conducted special for our general practitioners uh, who are listening here today. So I'm, I, I'm Dr. Mastura Muhammad Yusof. I'm a, an oncologist at uh, this hospital and I'm glad to have with me my two colleagues um, who are well experienced in their fields. Uh, we have today uh, Dr. Shamala Pusparaja, he, she's a consultant uh, respiratory physician and she will be speaking to you about lung cancer epidemiology, especially in, in non-smokers. And she, uh, her, her talk will be followed by Dr. Yogendran uh, Lechumanasami, who is our consultant nuclear medicine physician. And he will be talking to you uh, about investigation in lung cancer, but specifically uh, focusing on uh, PET, PET CT scan. And then this will be followed by my talk, which will be talking about treatment options uh, in the patients, uh, in this patient population. So without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Shamala to begin uh, her lecture for today, uh, Lung Cancer and Its Epidemiology. Dr. Shamala. Thank you, Dr. Masura. A very good afternoon to all of you who are present here today on a Saturday afternoon to listen to the three of us. We have a very interesting topic to share with you today, which is lung cancers in never smokers. So most of you are very familiar with smokers and lung cancers. But in never smokers, is this something new? Is it really a hidden disease? Let's share and see how things go in the next few slides. Now, why are we talking about lung cancers today? Why today? Well, as you would know, November is Lung Cancer Sir, Awareness. Awareness Month. Lung cancer is the number one cancer killer globally. And for once, we are not proud to be number one because you know, as in with all other things in life, number one is supposedly the best. But, you know, lung cancer being number one, why are we not giving adequate attention to this problem? Now, the focus of my talk will be on these five uh, subtopics, which is epidemiology, risk factors, symptoms, and screening tools will be a major fo focus of the presentation today followed by diagnosis. We'll go through a simple flowchart on how to make a diagnosis of lung cancer. Now, lung cancer is the second most common cancer worldwide, the first being skin cancer. But it is the number one leading cause of cancer deaths worldwide, which is why we are here today to share this topic with you. Every year, about 2.2 million new lung cancer cases are detected and 1.8 million people die worldwide. Now, that is a huge number. And in Malaysia, in our country, it is the third most common cancer, number one in males and fourth in females. Now, we all need to know what are the risk factors and among these risk factors, we need to know what is modifiable, meaning what can we do to change the cause of the disease? First and foremost, cigarette smoking, whether active or passive. All of us in our clinics would come across smokers, whatever disease or symptom they come to see us for. And that is probably the best time to take opportunity and advise them on the perils of cigarette smoking. Now, I would always tell my patients that with cigarette smoking, if one were to develop lung cancer, it may not be as bad as developing COPD because lung cancer, you know, the, the lifespan may not be as long as COPD. Whereas if one were to get chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, they suffer for years. So all of us have to find a means to explain and convince our patients that cigarette smoking is definitely a risk factor. Second, exposure to asbestos. Those who are working in the shipyard or 
any other line where asbestos is predominantly used, they're actually prone for lung cancer. And most of these cases present late. They actually present initially with asbestosis. And um, when these things appear on the x-ray in the lung itself, surgery is not an option, right? Third, exposure to radon and other elements. Those individuals who work with rock or minerals, they're actually predisposed to lung cancer because of this exposure. Now, having finished the modifiable risk factors, let's look at the non-modifiable risk factors. Patients with a family history of lung cancer, there is a family genetic uh, lung, uh, sorry, not just lung, family genetic cancer syndrome where one member of the family may have lung cancer and some other members may have other cancers. But if a patient has a first degree, degree relative with a family history of lung cancer, then certainly they are at risk. Now, the other thing that may not be known by many individuals is if a patient has a past history of lung diseases, for example, they have had tuberculosis in the past and they had a fibrosis or a scar. Now, these individuals have a 10% risk of these scars turning malignant over a period of time. Now, let's go into symptoms. As simple as these symptoms may seem, you will be surprised to note that many, many patients who present with a cough do not get investigated until months later when the cough turns out to be due to a cancer. So always when we see a patient who comes to us with a cough, we need to stop and think, is this the usual cough that one develops from an upper respiratory tract infection? Or is it a post-nasal drip cough? But always ask them, have you ever had this cough before? Is it a new cough, a different cough? And how long has it been? If it is there for more than three weeks despite antibiotics or any other form of treatment, please investigate further. A simple chest x-ray would do at that stage. Now, when somebody comes with blood in their phlegm, naturally, most of us will immediately do a chest x-ray or at the very least, phlegm to check for TB, which is very common in our country. Right? But now we also have to think about lung cancer when they actually cough out blood. Third, less common chest pain. Now, chest pain is notoriously associated with cardiac origin or even a reflux esophagitis. But patients who present with chest pain, most likely if it's associated with lung cancer, it would be at a later stage. So this is not one of the early symptoms to find, but do investigate them for a lung cause or origin. And last but not least, persistent breathlessness. Now again, the last two symptoms would only arise when the patient is well into an advanced stage of the lung cancer, since pleural effusions, which present with breathlessness, would be already a stage 4 disease. So always try to look at the symptom and then ask yourself, what is the cause of the symptom and investigate. Now, the other symptom that actually patients actually can volunteer or present would be a loss of appetite or an unexplained or unintentional weight loss. Now, the weight loss, many a times nowadays with people being health conscious, they actually intentionally want to lose weight. So please do ask them, is this intentional or otherwise? Persistent lethargy, apathy, this is common to many diseases and not specifically for lung cancer. Now, I'd like to draw your attention to the last symptom, which is no symptoms. This is where we must actually act. We do not want to wait until a patient has symptoms because this means they are in the later stage in their disease. Now, 95%, and that's a big number of patients, present in late stage disease, stage 3 and 4. And if you talk to them they, and you ask them, why did you come so late? They will tell you, doctor, I had no symptoms 
before this, how come? Why did I have no symptoms? I could have been, you know, picked up early and had curative surgery. But that's the way things are. 95%, mind you, is a large number. Now, this is where screening comes into play. All right? We do not want to pick up 95% in late stages. We want to pick it up early, preferably in stage one. So what is screening for lung cancer? Basically, it's designed to detect diseases early in the absence of symptoms or history of diseases. So this is actually a well patient, no symptoms of lung disease that we are going to screen. Now, unfortunately, at present time, there is no national lung cancer screening program in Malaysia as yet. And that's something that we ought to change. Now, we can't obviously go around screening everybody. Firstly, due to the cost. Secondly, radiation. And uh, we need to have a guideline on who to screen. Now, individuals who have no symptoms but are at high risk include patients who are current or ex-smokers between the ages of 45 to 75 years old and are or were heavy smokers. They must have a history of at least 20 pack years or more. Now, calculating the pack years is simple. You just have to ask the patient, how many cigarettes do you smoke per day? Divided by 20 times the number of years they have smoked. And you can come to this figure. Now, patients who have had not had lung cancer before or non-smokers who have a strong family history of lung cancer. So these are the patients who are included in the screening. You will realize that the emphasis basically are on heavy smokers or ex-heavy smokers. Now, at present time, the best screening modality available is a low-dose computed tomography scan of the lung. It's a simple test, no fasting is required, and no contrast medium is necessary. Hence, even patients with renal impairment are eligible for this test. Now, here is just a pictorial description of the advantages. If you look at number one, a low dose CT actually provides a very detailed imaging than the traditional chest x rays. As you know, chest x rays, we are unable to pick up small nodules when they are less than two centimeters in size, or they're actually under the diaphragm behind the heart. These are all missed. While in a low dose CT, you can pick up even in these areas. Secondly, it gives off 90% less radiation than a conventional CT scan. As you know, we Malaysians, we are also very health conscious in different ways. And when we mention a CT scan, the first thing a patient would ask you is, how about the radiation, right? So you can tell them that it's 90% less than a conventional CT scan. Now speed, in a busy lifestyle that most people have, they cannot come and spend the whole day in a hospital. And this scan takes only about 10 minutes. Last but not least, the images are accurate and research has shown that it saves more lives of those at high risk of lung cancer than traditional chest x-rays. Now, this is just a picture of a low-dose CT scan. If you look at this CT scan image, over the left side, this is at the upper lobe. This is an area where it is near impossible to pick up this nodule on a chest x-ray because the upper lobes are usually very crowded regions with a collarbone ribs overlapping each other. But on a CT scan, you can pick it up fairly early. Now, if you look at this study published one, from one of the radiology journals, you can see that with a low-dose CT as compared with the chest x-ray, 
Over the years of randomization, the number of lung cancer deaths are much reduced. And what does one do if a nodule or say we do a low-dose CT scan? How do we interpret this low-dose CT scan? What do we tell the patients? Or what, do we, what action do we take next? Now, this is just a simplified diagram, but let me tell you that different countries have different criteria and within the same country among centers, they may have different criteria. So if a patient has a very small lesion of less than six millimeter, we do not do a biopsy. We do an annual low dose CT just to monitor. And if the lesion is between six to eight, then the duration is shorter, six months. And as the size grows bigger, it would be three months. However, if it is more than 15 millimeter or something new pick, not picked up in the previous scan or growing more than eight millimeter, then we need to go ahead, either do a chest CT with or without contrast and tissue sampling with or without a PET CT. So different actions are taken depending on the findings. Now, if a patient comes to you with the symptoms that we discussed earlier, we're not talking about screening now. This is actually a patient with symptoms. We need to do complete blood tests, including CEA levels. CEA is a tumor marker, stands for uh, serial, uh, sorry, um, carcinoembryonic antigen. So these are not 100% um, foolproof. In many patients, when the levels are raised, they may actually have a tumor. But in patients with normal CEA levels, it does not mean there is no underlying tumor. We also do lung function tests, especially in smokers. We need a baseline lung function test a chest x-ray, and if the chest x-ray actually points towards a pathology, we proceed to do a CT scan. And lastly, we need a tissue diagnosis, which we can perform via a bronchoscopy or a percutaneous biopsy. And when we get this tissue, we will send it for immunohistochemical and molecular testing. Now, this is a pictorial about a flexible bronchoscopy, which is usually done by the respiratory physicians. It's an outpatient procedure, daycare, where the patient comes fasting and under sedation, a flexible camera scope is inserted either via the oral cavity or nasal pharynx into the airway, targeting the lesion. It is fairly safe, except for uh, minimal bleeding during biopsy, which can be controlled fairly easily. Additional tests, which my colleague will talk to you next about, would be the PET scan or the MRI of the brain. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shamala, for the excellent presentation. So I shall now invite Dr. Yogendran to deliver his talk. Thank you, Dr. Mastura. Good afternoon, all. Well, what we are going to be talking about the role of nuclear medicine in lung cancer. We can't really... Uh, choose whether it, I mean, we can't really say whether it's primary or secondary, but we can say whether it's malignant or not, most cases, right? The outline is going to be as follows. I'm going to be introducing nuclear medicine since uh, a lot of people do not know what we do. And I've even been asked whether we make bombs. We don't. Uh, we're introducing, we're introducing, I'll be introducing PET CT, the principal preparation and the procedure, and we'll go into the images. Ready? Can't see it. Okay, this is the definition of nuclear medicine. It's a medical specialty involving the application of 
usually trace amount of radioactive substances in the diagnosis and treatment of diseases. And uh, it basically is divided into two, PET CT and general nuclear medicine, or we can divide it into diagnostic and therapeutic uh, aspects. Okay, in some cases, the department is not called Department of Nuclear Medicine. It is, they take half of diagnostic and half of therapeutic. And sorry, technical difficulties here. They take half of diagnostic and half of therapeutic and make it the department of diagnostics. Okay, what we inject is something called FDG. It stands for fluorodeoxyglucose. It is a glucose analog. And it is the most commonly used PET tracer. It doesn't move. Okay. Sorry, Sorry for that. Slight technical difficulties again. And uh, this, as I said, is the most commonly used, used uh, PET tracer. And normally, in terms of glucose, glucose is taken into the cell and is phosphorylated by hexokinase, and it's it becomes glucose 6-phosphate which undergoes glycolysis. But in terms of FDG, it is taken into the cell, goes through the phosphorylation, and go, it, because of the hexokinase, it turns into FDG6-phosphate. And that cannot enter the glycolytic cycle, and it is trapped within the cell. And it, it is further absorbed and concentrated now, the reason why we do this is uh, I'm not about to put down anybody or bring up anybody. Uh, when we do a non-contrasted CT, all the tissues look the same. Of course, when we use contrast, there are some changes. All right, What we do is we are looking at anatomy and physiology. So when we look at this, uh, the picture, we are looking for this. This is adapted from... Uh, West Wally, Wally. So I first called it Mal, Mal. Uh, in short, short for malignant cells. cells. And when you look at the picture, it's a contrasted CT. Everything looks the same. You do not know where the malignant cell is. But when we add FDG in it, you know exactly where the malignant cell is. Okay. I know a lot of patients might come and ask you. What is the procedure? What do we do? Why do we need to do? Basically, you need to uh, remember just three things for, for now. They have got to come faster in the morning. It's got to be a six to eight hour fast. The blood sugar should be less than eight millimole per liter. If it is high, we will have to give insulin or reschedule the patient. If it's say within 11 or 12, we can still give insulin. If it's in the 20s, there's no point giving insulin, we just reschedule. Uh, speak to the referring physician and then tell them to control the sugar and uh, send the patient back. Uh, in case of diabetics, they are faster, but they are not supposed to take their morning dose of medication. Number three is they should, they should not exercise or do any strenuous ex uh, activity for the 48 hours prior to the to the PET CT procedure. If they do that, there will be a lot of muscular uptake. And FDG may not go into the malignant tissue as much as we would want them to. All right. This is what the patients need to know as well. They need to be in the department for five to six hours. So it is not an X-ray where they come in, take an X-ray and go out in uh, five or 10 minutes. They have to be sure that they are going to be there for about five to six hours. So once they, once they come into the department, we will take uh, fasting blood sugar 
and one uh, when it's less than 8.0 we inject them with FTG they will be waiting or resting for an hour that is the uptake time that is that gives time for the FTG to circulate around the body and be concentrated in where it's supposed to be concentrated meaning the tumor tissue and after that hour is up we will take them and scan them and the scanning process takes roughly 30 minutes and after that they will usually come they can have their meal we will usually have a look at the images to see whether it can be reported if the patient has moved or if there's any confusion we will do a delete scan and then when we are able to report they are able to leave and then they, they it takes time to report you can either have a brief but early report where it's going to be a page or a detailed and comprehensive uh, report and that takes time and usually the entire process of reporting not the, the imaging the entire process of reporting takes about two hours at least Okay, the role of PET CT in cancers in general, we stage the cancer. And in, in some cases, like lung cancers, we assess the operability. If it is only in the lung, it can be operated upon. But if there's any distant metastasis, straight away the staging changes and you can't operate. And in some cases, after the operation of the chemotherapy, we restage. And we can even do PET CT for surveillance on a yearly basis, especially in cases like lymphoma. The other reason why we do PET CT is, is to look for unknown primary. The patient has some symptoms of malignancy or they have secondary uh, features of malignancy metastatic disease. And then they are sent uh, to us to look for the primary uh, focus. And in lung cancers, if the patient has got a solitary pulmonary nodule, we can do PET CT as well. And we can also do PET CT for radiotherapy planning. And some people ask whether we can do screening. It is not a good modality to screen because of the radiation involved. There are other methods for screening which takes lesser amount of radiation. Like what Dr. Uh, Sharma said just now, a low dose CT, the radiation level is about two millisieverts for the entire procedure. And for PET CT, but you got PET CT is about 14 millisieverts. But you got to understand a high dose CT will be about five to seven millisieverts per part, meaning thoracic. CT will be 5 to 7. It depends on the energy used. Abdomen, 5 to 7. Pelvis, 5 to 7. So just thorax, abdomen, pelvis is 21 millisieverts. And we actually use a low dose CT as well, but not as low as the diagnostic low dose CT that uh, she was talking about. But our procedure is from vertex to mid thigh. And that is about 14 millisieverts for the entire procedure. And that's roughly 7 millisieverts for PET and 7 millisieverts for the CT. And in cases of uh, lung cancers, like what we are talking about, if patient comes with prolonged cough with unknown cause or hemoptysis, or if there's an X-ray or CT findings, or they have to investigate increased tumor markers, we can do a PET CT. Or if there's unexplained weight loss or symptoms of metastatic disease. A solitary pulmonary nodule is defined as something well circumscribed lesion, measuring less, less than four cm. And conventionally, we used to do either a biopsy or a CT follow up for two years. If the size is stable for two years, it is assumed to be benign. 
if it is increasing in size, we biopsy it. But what happens is many of these benign lesions were biopsy, and some of these malignant lesions, the, the, there is a delay in diagnosis. So, as long as the size is adequate, meaning more than 1 cm, when we do uh, FTG PET CT, if it is MTG avid, it's taken to be pathological. And not only can we say where the uh, nodule is, we can direct the biopsy to the most uh, avid part, the hottest area. And we can, we can decide whether the nodule is malignant or benign. Benign will not take up any FTG with some caveats, which I shall go to next. Malignant lesions will be very, very hot, meaning they will be very FTG avid. But the downside to it is FTG is also taken up in infection and inflammation. So we have got to decide whether it is infection or inflammation or if it is tumor. So this is where we look at the SUV counts. If the SUV counts is, say, very is equal to liver or slightly above, usually it is either infection or inflammation. Usually the FTG, uh, the SUV counts of liver is about 2 to 2.5. If the SUV is 2.5 or 3, likely infection, if it is 9 or 10, it's very, very likely to be tumor. If we are still not sure, we do a two-point imaging, meaning the initial scan, followed by a delayed imaging about an hour later. By convention, usually, if the SUV counts increases in the second image, it is taken to be tumor. And if it decreases, it is taken to be infection or inflammation. But in, not in all cases that this could be true. So we also need to look at the CT characteristics of this thing. If the nodule is stipulated, more likely it is malignant. It is a primary. If it is smooth surface, may not be malignant, also depending on the SUV counts. And if it is smooth surface, it is usually a uh, 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 metastatic lesion. And we need to see whether it's cavitating or not. If it is cavitating and it's FTG avid, it is likely to be a uh, tubercular lesion. There are some limitations. If the nodule is too small, less than 1 cm, the amount of cells within is not enough to adequately concentrate FTG to trigger off a positive response. So in which case, we do a serial CT scan and monitor the size, and if it becomes more than 1 cm, we can repeat the capacity. The other limitation is breathing movements. We need to look at the PET as well as the CT images, because sometimes there's uptake in different segments of the lung. So the newer, uh, the newer uh, machines have got respiratory gating. If the patient is having bronchial alveolar carcinoma, mucinous carcinoma or neuroendocrine tumor, they may not take up FTG. Okay, this is a case of primary lung tumor. This was sent to us to assess operability. So the, the premise was if it is just confined to the lung with no metastasis, the patient will have the tumor re uh, resected. But looking at it, you see a lot of these small black spots. It could mean that it is metastatic. Up on the head, brain uses a lot of glucose, so it is going to be very avid as well. The patient is diabetic, so you can see the colon very clearly because the patient is uh, on metformin therapy. I know the slides are small, but what you can see is actually a one small nodule that is speculated, and this is actually a primary lung nodule. Patient never smoked before, but he has got a high uh, family history of cancer. It has metastasized to the precranial node, and you can see a, a bone metastasis as well, and the hyla node. 
and this is a clearer image of the bone metastatic lesion. And on sagittal image, we will be able to say that which which vertebrae uh, is affecting is affected. Okay, this is a very interesting case. The history goes like this: is a 58-year-old female, non-smoker. She had ovarian cancer in 2004. This patient came to us about two or three months ago. So ovarian cancer was 17 years ago. She had TAPSO and four cycles of chemotherapy, and she came in with one day history of Frank hemoptysis. We did a chest x-ray and there was a mass at the left, left lower lobe. And on the left side of the screen, when you look at the larger black dot or larger black lesion above the kidney, you can mistake it to be the, the, the cardiac uptake, but when we shift the thing, you can see there's something behind, behind the heart. And we do a CT image, a PET CT, a fused image. The image on your left most it is pure CT. The right most is pure PET, and the one in the middle is fused images. Okay, what we found is that the mass is FDG added. It had an SUV of 9.2, so very likely to be malignant. Size was big, 3.5 by 5.2 by 2.6. Surface was smooth, and we found left hyalur nodes and subcarinal. Not only that, we found a uh, match to the transverse process of T9 vertebra. And she was operated upon because of the hemoptysis they needed to control that. And the HPE report was metastatic endometrioid carcinoma, consistent with ovarian origin. So after 17 years, we found a metastatic lesion. And there was also metastasis to the hyalur node. There was no mention of the subcarinal node. But it doesn't make a difference because it's already stage four and it's not operable. Okay, these are some of the other uh, images. When you see a PET CT report, the size, size of the lesion is different, different from a CT report, report because, because we, we are, are, we are, are measuring, measuring the metabolic volume of it, metabolic size. size. So, so you, you can, can see the left lung. The size of the color area is smaller than the entire lesion, meaning that the active area is confined to the smaller area. And the same patient came with multiple mass. This, uh, this is metastatic lesion to almost every bone. And metastasis to the liver. Multiple sites in the liver. Okay, this, we find this recently. This is not lung cancer. This patient came for some other malignancy for PET and we found this sort of a hazy opacity in the, in the periphery. After I reported, we asked the patient some questions and wanted to know more about his lifestyle. And we found out that he had he was diagnosed to have COVID infection one month before that. And this is what we find in, in COVID patients. Right, with that, I end. Thank you very much. In case you need more uh, information about PET-CT, you can email me at this email address. I do not promise to reply immediately, but you will definitely get a reply. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Yogan, for the refreshing look at PET scan and lung cancer. So I will now talk to you about the treatment options for lung cancers. Uh, it's, it's, it's actually a very, very important topic. Anyone can get lung cancer, smokers or non-smokers, but uh, just anyone. So in, historically, lung cancer 
was treated uh, with just these three basic modalities, mainly if they are operable, then operable, they, they will be operated, then we be chemotherapy for those with advanced cancers, and then uh, radiotherapy as well. So uh, the treatment was simple. The, the principle was lung cancer treated as lung cancer. And so there were limited options. There were less of multidisciplinary involvement in the care of the lung cancer patients. So that translated into poor survival uh, rate for patients that you know uh, prior, to, prior to now. So we have learned that uh, for lung cancer patients, especially in Asia, there are a larger proportion that are actually never smokers. So as you can see in this chart, smoking prevalence of lung cancer patients by gender, you could see that in Asian countries, there were a lot of female patients that were actually non-smokers and suffer from lung cancer as compared to people in the Western population. And not just that, not just that, that there are more uh, lung cancer patients who are non-smokers, the histological type of patients who are you know, who have lung cancer today have also changed. We used to have a lot of small cell lung cancer or squamous cell lung cancer that are associated with smoking. Nowadays, we have more patients who have non-small cell lung cancer. And the most common type between the non-small cell lung cancer is the adenocarcinoma, which are the type of cancers that are very, very important for us to learn today because it is associated with some abnormalities or genetic abnormalities that we can target in order for us to give more options in terms of treatment for this patient population. So this is just to show um, that non small cell lung cancer now is the majority of lung cancer uh, cases that we see in clinic. And this is basically uh, studies done in multiple countries in Asia. And you can see the study done in UM, UM Medical Center where about 88% of their patients were non small cell lung cancer. So you can see that there will be a lot of adenocarcinomas within this patient population that we see every day. So the lung cancer classification not just go uh, stop at non-small cell lung cancer, as I mentioned, as more patients have adenocarcinomas. And in these patients who are um, um, who we see often in clinic, they are more than just adenocarcinoma. We can do multiple molecular subtyping of the patients where you can identify if they carry some mutations. So I can see that here, there were a lot of mutations that are basically the risk, they can be driving uh, the, the cancer, means that these are the driver mutation that leads to the cancer forming and leads to the aggressiveness of the cancer. And this is something that we can target with uh, drugs, right? So as a reason of uh, the advances that you have just heard, you, you know, you have uh, low dose uh, CT scan to screen for lung cancers, you have PET scan, you have better treatment, you have better classification of the disease. So you can see that the mortality that you used to know from lung cancer has reduced, while the, the number of survivors with patients with lung cancer has also increased. Although this is actually from, you know, more developed states, the United States, but of course, we are, we are not any lower, <laughs> we are actually improving, we are going that way. So yeah, so now going to the treatment options, what do we have today? Because historically we didn't have a lot, not a lot of options, but what do we have today? So in patients who have uh, non-metastatic lung cancer, means they don't have advanced stage lung cancers, and we are seeing these patients more now compared to last time. So normally they will be treated with surgery and radiotherapy, but sometimes surgery and radiotherapy may not be enough. They need more than that. Or maybe sometimes surgery cannot be done or radiotherapy cannot be done for whatever reason. So what, what else can we treat, treat them with? So this will, will be the topic for me to discuss for you today where, for example, you can learn about stereotactic body radiotherapy in place of surgery in patients with very early lung cancer. And for patients who have had surgery, maybe they can be treated with oral pills and maybe with immunotherapy. Okay, So I will just give you an example of how, how we um, put, uh, put this application in clinic. So this is Mr. TF, who's a 74-year-old patient with comorbids of uh, diabetes, hypertension, and coronary artery disease. So he had a COVID uh, infection, and because of that, he had a chest X-ray done and coincidentally was found to have a single left lung nodule. So he had a CT scan as well as a PET CT scan, and that showed a 3-centimeter lesion at the lower lobe of the lung and none elsewhere. So the biopsy of the lung confirmed medinocarcinoma and usually the standard of care for patients like this who have stage 2A uh, cancer is surgery. But unfortunately for Mr. TF, his lung function test was poor. So he, he failed his lung function test prior to the surgery. So it was considered at the MDT that he's actually medically inoperable. So what, what else can we do for him because he has a very, very highly curable cancer? 
So this comes to the, the application of stereotactic body radiation therapy, which basically is a treatment that delivers very high dose of radiation, really, really focusing to the tumor target with high precision. So high dose, high precision. And usually this is given in a single fraction or maybe up to five times uh, to, the, to the targeted area. So this is usually for patients who are medically or surgically inoperable or patients are medically operable, but they do not want the surgery for whatever reason. So this is an option for them. So usually this is allowed if the patients have uh, small tumors that's not more than five centimeters because that allows us to actually deliver the high-dose radiation while sparing the, the surrounding tissue. So the toxicity will not be so much. And the tumor must be uh, not uh, close to any major organ, major vessels, the heart, the esophagus. And patients might have good performance status and they are able to actually lie flat on our radiotherapy couch for about an hour for the planning time and as well as the treatment. So this is basically how it looks like where we are, uh, you know, angling the radiation to the small focus of tumor with that stereotactic body uh, radiotherapy delivery technique that you can actually use any of the um, uh, radiotherapy uh, modalities or machines that I put up here. So this is basically how the tumor that is targeted looks like, where we actually also deliver a bit of um, radiation to the surrounding normal tissue so that we do not miss uh, the tumor when we are uh, delivering the radiation to the patient. Okay, so the patient was planned for the uh, stereotactic body radiotherapy with active breathing co uh, coordinator system that is to ensure that the, the tumor does not escape the radiation feel when the patient is breathing and the treatment is, is being given. Okay, so uh, this technique of radiotherapy does not need any sedation or anesthesia, you know, it just as it is in an outpatient treatment and patient can immediately return to activities. And in this patient, a repeat scan done past, uh, after two years showed a good disease control of the cancer. So we are not actually trying to rival surgery uh, in terms of early lung cancer patient uh, treatment, but this is an option for cure in patients with early lung cancer that is not suitable to, to do radiotherapy, uh, to do surgery. So surgery is still the primary treatment, but should they not, uh, you know, not suitable to have radiotherapy, then you can actually do, uh, have the stereotactic body radiotherapy, where you can see there are a lot of studies that's, that shows that it has a very good percent of local control and, and very good very good survival rate. Okay, so anything else new in the in the realm of non-metastatic lung cancer? So we have adjuvant targeted therapy and adjuvant immunotherapy. So again, another case. So this is a 48-year-old female non-smoker that presented with a mild hoarseness of voice. So biopsy uh, confirmed adenocarcinoma of the left lung with a left hilar lymph node that was probably uh, compressing on the recurrent laryngeal nerve, causing the mild hoarseness of voice. So this patient actually had a left lower lobectomy surgery and lymph node dissection, and her final diagnosis was a stage 2B adenocarcinoma of the lung. And she also had a tumor molecular test done, and she is found to have this uh, molecular subtype called EGFR mutation positive at exon 19. So she was treated with a standard adjuvant chemotherapy with cisplatin and pemetrexate for about four cycles after her surgery. So the, the question now is, if a patient with non, who are non-smokers develop adenocarcinoma and is in the curable state and have surgery and chemotherapy, what else can be done after we know that the cancer that this patient has has a mutation that is driving the cancer to happen in the first place? So we know that adenocarcinoma can have the, all these mutations. So this patient did uh, was tested for EGFR and, uh, and we want to see whether is there anything else other than the standard treatment that can help in controlling the cancer from coming back. So non-small non -small cell lung cancer with this uh, EGFR receptor mutation is very common in women, Asian, and non-smokers. And usually the, the, the subtype is adenocarcinoma. So as I mentioned, this is the oncogenic driver. So um, and, and this is commonly seen in our patient population. So in this group of patients that had surgery, they, they, uh, a study was conducted to look at whether this patient who had surgery, who had, who had chemotherapy or did not have chemotherapy, but should they have the EGFR mutation, a study was conducted to, to look at if they receive a drug called osimatinib that is a, like a targeted therapy against that EGFR mutation versus uh, none. And they look at whether this treatment can actually improve the patient's survival. So this study with about 600 patients uh, with uh, in, in between stage 2 to 3 lung cancers with or without chemotherapy, then they received the, the treatment. So 
In this study, the results shows that there is improvement in the patient disease-free survival when they receive the osimatinib treatment versus none. And you can see that the, in terms of uh, subgroup, because we have patients who have either male or female, they can be old or young, they can be smoker or non-smoker, and they can be they have different types of AGFR mutation. They may or may not have chemotherapy, especially for those who have stage one B to two A, they may not need the chemotherapy. Then after surgery, they, they immediately take the drug. So in this study, across all the subgroups, all of them benefited from the addition of the uh, osimatinib drug. Okay. Okay. What about stage three lung cancer? So. Uh, in patients who have stage 3 lung cancer, not many of them can have the surgery. So most of them who do not have surgery, how do we treat them usually in clinic? So what we do is we give them uh, platinum-based uh, doublet chemotherapy concurrent with six weeks of radiotherapy. So this is the radiotherapy that is different from the stereotactic body radiotherapy just now. So these are the patients who have higher uh, a stage disease and they require more. So their radiotherapy is six weeks together with the chemo. So with this epic, uh, with this treatment uh, regimen, the median progression-free survival, the median survival of patient having had this treatment is just about eight to 10 months from the start of concurrent chemo radiotherapy and only 15% are alive at five years. So people looked at how can we improve on this patient's uh, outcome. So this is an, a, another uh, example where this patient we, who presented with supraclavicular lymph nodes and a, a, a nodule in the right upper loop of the lung. So he is he has uh, you know good uh, ECOP performance status uh, and just have hypercholesterolemia. And a CT guided biopsy was also EGFR, uh, sorry, it was adenocarcinoma, but the EGFR uh, mutation was negative. So this was a patient who has stage 3B adenocarcinoma of the lung. So naturally for these patients, I'm so sorry about this. So naturally for these patients, they will be treated with concurrent chemo radiotherapy. So again, the question of after the concurrent chemo radiotherapy, what else can you do? What else can you do? So people looked at immunotherapy in non-small cell lung cancer. So in the in the patient's uh, tumor, the immune system are there supposedly to check on uh, on cancer. So the, the immune system are supposed to actually uh, kill the cancer cells, but sometimes they are not doing that because the tumors uh, express checkpoint inhibitors. The checkpoints, uh, the checkpoint inhibitors uh, are, um, are needed in order for us to activate our immune system. So in this patient uh, type of patients, uh, trials that looked at uh, added, adding uh, immunotherapy after a patient has had chemo radiotherapy for their stage 3 lung cancers were conducted. And in this trial, they give the immunotherapy duvalumab up to 12 months after the patient has completed their initial treatment. So again, in this trial, without uh, versus not giving anything to patients after they have had concurrent chemo radiotherapy, you see an improvement in progression free and overall survival in all subgroups in this in this trial, regardless of the tumor histology, regardless of um, smoking, regardless as age, sex, etc., and etc. So, and in, on top of that, when you add immunotherapy for a year after the patient has had concurrent chemo radiotherapy, in terms of safety, means the toxicity effects of the disease uh, of the disease and the treatment were actually pretty similar between. Uh, placebo and duvalumab. So in this patient that I mentioned, case 3, he had the concurrent chemo radiotherapy and after that, a PET scan was done and that showed that his disease was resolved. And subsequently, he had the treatment with duvalumab for about 24 cycles. And you can see that his cancer remained stable and remained controlled up to about three years after uh, the whole treatment has completed. So he has not come since COVID. So I'm quite sure that he's He's probably still alive by now. Okay, so what about any advanced stage or metastatic lung cancer? Anything new there? So um, this was the usual treatment that we have for advanced stage cancer. So chemotherapy is the gold standard. We have a lot of chemotherapy regimens, but basically they are platinum-based. means that we, we will combine platinum together with a different, different, different uh, chemotherapy agent. But the the outcome that you get in terms of, for example, how, how many months are you able to actually uh, control the can uh, make the patient survive after the cancer diagnosis is actually quite poor, whereby you can get at about, just about slightly less than a year. And even if you add targeted therapy, you also get about a year. So that is not so good. So 
when we know that patients may carry some mutations, some you know abnormalities within their tumor, then we can personalize the treatment based on what is the mutation that the patient have in their tumor. So that comes to the targeted therapy that we use for advanced stage breast cancer, uh, lung cancer. These are drugs that block the growth and spread of cancer by interfering with that part, that, that particular mutation or that particular molecule that is abnormal, that is involved in the cancer growth and progression. So when we only focus on these parts that we know only cancer cells have, then maybe you are not going to um, disturb the normal cells. So the side effect profile for using targeted therapy is actually better. So this becomes a promising strategy in treating patients with advanced non-small cell lung cancer that has that target, okay? So we know this already, that patients with lung cancer may have targets and these mutations are, are, are what we are, uh, you know, uh, targeting now. So again, remember the EGFR mutation are more frequent in never smokers, female and Asian and adenocarcinoma histology. So if let's say a patient with advanced cancer come to you, they are female, they're Asian, they're non-smoker, they are, you know, they're having adenocarcinoma and they have stage four disease, don't tell them that they only have six months to live because they are going to do very well when they take on the targeted therapy that is suitable for them. So you can see in Malaysia, the, the number of patients or the percentage of patients with this kind of lung cancers to have the mutation is about 40%. Okay, So these are the available oral pills that we can give to these patients whenever they have the, any of the mutation that I mentioned. Okay, And this is just to show to you what are the median progression free survival difference when you have chemotherapy, which is here, it's about 5.1, 4.6, 6 months. But when you have the targeted therapy, which are just pills, then you can actually improve it to be so much more than just chemotherapy. Okay, And these are, again, uh, the progression-free survival that basically benefit every everyone. So I always have patients who say, uh, doctor, my gran grandmother or my mother is so old and they're so frail now with lung cancer, can treat or not? The answer is yes, they can be treated. And we know that when they're taking the, the, the pills, when they have that mutation, they do benefit. Okay. In terms of toxicities, okay, these are the toxicities that you see with chemotherapy. And you can see that roughly all the toxicities that you see when you're treating lung cancer with chemotherapy is lesser when you use the targeted therapy. Okay, So this is just to show a rash that is associated with the drug, but it is very, very well manageable. It can be severe, but nowadays patients are very you know, more educated. We can manage this uh, well with them. Okay, so this is just to show the journey of an individual uh, patient. Uh, last time, with just historically with just chemotherapy alone, about eight months. Now, with the with targeting the mutation with good drugs, you know, you can go up to three years. And now this is actually five years. Okay, so this just uh, just the last just give me five minutes to just discuss this case because this is a very important case that involves a GP that is also a, a, a senior of mine. So this is a single GP who was a never smoker and he presented with bilateral neck nodes and dyspnea from a massive left pleural effusion. And uh, investigation found that he has multiple metastases that involve the limb nodes, involve the bones as well as the brain. And he had a, a biopsy, adenocarcinoma, and he also had a mutation. And he told me that he just opened his own clinic and he would like to continue running it while having treatment. So this was uh, his disease initially. Uh, before the treatment, so that is his lung cancer here, okay, and these were her, his uh, uh, brain metastasis on MRI at first presentation. So he was started with a tablet, okay, and you can see at three months, uh, this was his tumor, and this is his tumor after three months after his, he took the tablet, okay, so remarkable response. And this was also resolution of his brain metastasis after he has had the treatment at six months and, uh, and at two years. So uh, there are other strategies, but I'm running out of time. But there are other strategies, that, uh, other strategies that we can use, that, such as ALK, where you can give the treatment for ALK mutation positive lung cancer, and you can see marked response seen in this liver metastasis as well as the lung tumors. Okay. Okay. So these are all the drugs that there are. Okay. Finally, sorry, you you all have to see this and seeing how how many drugs are there that we can use in our patients with lung cancer. Okay, so the final, I, I probably have three or four slides. Okay, so this is basically for immunotherapy. I know that a lot of people ask about immunotherapy and they are not, uh, not very sure about what is actually the immunotherapy that we use. So what is very important to know is that not everyone is suitable to have immunotherapy uh, treatment. 
we only give immunotherapy to patients who have the PDL1 expression. Means that their tumor express that PDL1, and uh, depending on the percentage of the PDL1 expression within the tumor, then only we use the immunotherapy. So you can see here there are various immunotherapy uh, drugs that we can use for patients with lung cancer, and all of them needs the expression of PDL1 to be positive in their tumor. Okay, so these are all the immune checkpoint drugs that we use. So other than this, we do not use and that's probably alternative therapies to medicine. So all these drugs have been uh, tested in clinical trials and all of them actually improve overall survival and therefore they have become the standard for patients with lung cancer that has expression of the PDL1. So these are the toxicity profile for immunotherapy. They are quite favorable, not really, not usually not, not a lot of side effects at all compared to chemotherapy. And this is for data to show that immunotherapy combined with chemotherapy for some patients who have low expression of pdl one also works, okay? And this is the busy current treatment landscape of lung cancer and that's why patient is surviving more. And so, yeah, let's give them hope that they can do very well nowadays, okay? So this is just to show the oncology services in Malaysia and this is our plea to, to all of us that we don't work alone. Please refer patients, okay? And advanced stage disease is now considered as chronic disease. They are no longer like six months uh, expected survival. So give a benefit of the doubt for all patients that you see. Do refer them and increase index of, of suspicion if that say, you know, because of the increased incidence of uh, lung cancer. Okay, with that, I thank you. So I will now uh, thank you for your attention. So I will now open the floor for any uh, questions. Dr. Allen is asking. Okay, Dr. Allen is asking, why are non-small cell lung cancer more common these days? Maybe Dr. Shamala would like to take on that, that question. Non-small cell. Yeah. I, I think multiple factors. Um, we, we don't really have a specific cause for lung cancers or any other cancers per se, but... Um, Mastura, you want to help me as to the okay. oncology? <laughs> okay. Um, the the trend of having non-small cell lung cancer becoming more common now, and, and especially for adenocarcinoma, is probably because of the change. Basically, the is the effect of uh, westernization and urbanization, where the the causes for the for the for the um, carcinogenesis has changed. So it's no longer uh, smoking, environmental exposures and all that, you have now cancers that occur in the periphery and not in the in the central bronchus. And that is probably genetics, that is probably uh, um, uh, other environmental causes like westernization and urbanization of lifestyle. So that is that could be the reason. But nobody can actually pinpoint why, what are the actual causes or why there is a trend change. So what we do see Patients who are, like, like I mentioned, female, Asians, they are non-smokers. We see this trend in them, but there's no exact causes. Why? But uh, people have, have spoken about uh, genes, uh, Asian genes. People have talk, uh, spoken about uh, changing in, 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 in the, the lifestyle, but no exact causes. Why? Okay, Dr. Allen has a question. What screening strategies for never smokers then? It's the same, it's the same. Yeah. Hmm. So the never smokers, smokers, I think the, the best screening modality is still a low-dose CT thorax. Initially, they started off by doing sputum for cytology, but somehow that was not proven to be effective, uh, cost-effective as well as uh, results-wise. So the best screening strategy is still basically only a low-dose CT thorax. I agree with that because the although the, the the screening strategy they actually classify the patients that that uh, indicated are uh, the never the um what do you call that uh, smokers okay but there are a lot of people out there who are also passive smokers uh, and all of us all of us are basically exposed to to uh, radiation as well from the earth from cosmic radiation so. I believe that the low dose CT scan is is good to be done for any of us who are over fifty, not just people who are previous smokers. But that 
then again, uh, it's not actually a, a mass screening. It's actually a, a, an opportunity screening, right, Shamala? It's, a, it's yeah. not mass, mass screening for lung cancer. But anyone that has uh, that wants to come uh, uh, and, and discuss with their doctors about screening, they, they, are, they are always uh, free to do so. Okay, so is it? What are the other causes besides smoking? Okay, Shamala, I think. I think um, if you had seen my slide, smoking is one of those causes, but it's also uh, mentioned that, you know, exposure to workplace uh, causes like asbestos, radon, and uh, we also talked about non-modifiable, meaning genetics. So if you have a family history of cancers, not just lung cancer, it could be breast cancer or colorectal cancer, then you also have a risk of developing lung cancer. And sometimes, you know, none of these factors may be present, neither smoking, workplace exposure, or even family history of cancer. So at the end of the day, we don't really have a specific causative factor for lung cancer. So that's what makes it so difficult, you know. But I think now with the advent of uh, more um, genomic testing, right? We have a lot of patients now who have, for example, breast cancer, um, ovarian cancer, or pancreatic cancer, or uh, those with uh, gastric cancer. More and more patients are doing the genomic uh, testing. And then sometimes they will do the hereditary gene testing. And then some of them who may actually are found to have uh, P53 or Lee-Formany syndrome, they may actually be at higher risk for lung cancer. So uh, I guess we are moving towards um, towards that now where we, we may may know more about genetics in, in, in predisposing people to lung cancer. Okay, I wonder if there's any other question from the public. Okay. Okay, so uh, thank you everyone for staying on and uh, I would like to invite you guys to stay on, uh, to scan your, your QR code for your CPD point. Okay, all right. Okay then, so yeah, it's a wrap. So thank you everyone and please have a uh, nice weekend and stay safe. Thank you, Dr. Stop the camera.